Hello. So I'm Thijs from Amsterdam, and uh, I just want to say hi to my three-year-old kid uh, who's watching on the live stream at the moment. So, uh, hi, Luz. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So imagine uh, uh, you run a SaaS company. Uh, it's like the third month uh, of your existence. And you wake up in the middle of the night and PagerDuty is calling you uh, uh, that the server is down. And the only other person who can actually fix it is on, is on holiday in South Asia. Um, so you spend an hour fixing this thing. You go back to sleep and you wake up really groggy. And then you find five support issues in your inbox. Uh, and actually, you can make no progress on the feature you're working on that, that you were really looking forward to. Um, and then, like, like at lunch, you get an email from this old freelancing uh, client you had who, give, who, who was offering you a super lucrative job. And you're thinking, like, why am I doing this again? And this sort of like emotion is what I want you to focus on during this talk. This is, uh, uh, that's what we're really going to delve into. So let's get started with some definitions. Uh, what's SaaS? Uh, SaaS is software as a service. So it's, uh, it's software you deliver over the internet um, on usually a monthly basis. So somebody pays you some money and you solve a problem for them and they have no hassle. They can just use the thing without really thinking about it too much. So uh, you're all familiar with a number of these, uh, these SaaS companies uh, that use the, all basically use the exact same business model uh, that we use as well. And uh, this one you're probably not familiar with, the long, slow ramp of death. And uh, uh, we'll get a lot deeper into this in a bit, but it comes down to, uh, uh, it describes the revenue curve that you will see in a SaaS business uh, in the early years. Uh, and it's called the ramp of death because uh, your costs are pretty high and then you kind of have to slowly grow uh, up to the base level of your costs. Uh, so you are, are by default dead uh, most of the way. So this is my SaaS. It's uh, called AppSignal and it's the best monitoring tool for uh, Ruby and Elixir teams that want to build a really high quality application. Um, so why am I here talking about this? And I think if you were here this morning, uh, Sam uh, uh, talked about this a bit uh, already as well. Like it's, it's uh, I love the technical stuff. Uh, I've actually done technical presentations mostly, but in the end, um, it, it's all about like what, what, what technology is really doing in the world. And uh, uh, so, so we need, I think we need to think a bit more about the context around it as well. So, uh, I think you have four ways as a developer to make money. And, uh, 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 and doing a SaaS is one of them, but let, let's look at the other ones first. So you can work as an employee. Uh, and I've actually, uh, I'm in a fortunate situation that I, I ne I've never actually had a job because uh, I started uh, uh, a client services company straight out of college. So I'm not super familiar with this, but like people tell me it's, uh, it's about, uh, it has some pros and cons. So you always get paid, uh, unless your employer is going bankrupt. In that case, uh, you're out of luck. Uh, another really big upside is that if you uh, uh, play your cards well, you can find a team of people that you can learn from and, and that will help you grow as a developer. Uh, banks will allow you to get a mortgage. Uh, and you usually don't have to make all your own decisions. So if you're, uh, uh, person with pretty low stress tolerance, it can be nice to just like close your laptop at five and have somebody else worry about the impact of all the stuff that you did. Uh, this can also be frustrating. So if you are the type of person that's, that wants a lot of control over their work, uh, it's really can be really frustrating if somebody's making decisions for you. So if you get a new boss or something like that, uh, you, you might totally spoil your work, uh, the pleasure in your work. Um, same goes for new hires. Maybe you don't have influence over the whole hiring process and you end up with some people on your team that you might not like or, or co cooperate with well. Uh, and finally, you're probably not going to become fin financially independent this way. So the second way is uh, working as a freelancer. So um, the, uh, the big upside of that is that you, uh, you can make a super good income in the current market. 
So I have some friends who do this, and they're basically just, just paying off a, a, a house in Amsterdam, which is pretty expensive in, in a decade, just by, by running a lot of billable hours. Um, you can move around between, the, between projects a lot, so that can be nice uh, if you're into that. This is another one of those that's, that can also be a con based on your personality type. So you do, uh, uh, you cannot really invest into a code base for a very long time. Uh, and some people I know end up just paying off a lot of other people's technical debt all the time. Now the first option is basically a scaled up version of freelancing. So this is something uh, uh, me and my co-founders of AppSignal did for, uh, for a number of years before we started the product company. So uh, this business model is basically like freelancing. So you get projects from your clients, they uh, pay you per deliverable or per hour, and then you send a bill uh, after doing the work, and basically that's it. The pro here is that you get paid pretty fast, and you can make a lot of money at this if you do it at a small scale. If you're still with three, four people, and you're all billable all the time, uh, that's, that's a really good business. And you can also make money at this at a, at a larger scale. So if you're above 20 people, it starts becoming really, really lucrative again. Uh, the con is that, that there's a, the medium scale in between these two things is really quite awful. Because there comes a point uh, where, you, where the, the original founders have to spend so much time on project managing and making sure that everybody's happy that you're not billable yourself anymore. But if you don't have enough people to actually compensate for that, uh, uh, you basically make no money. But the biggest downside of this uh, business model is that you will encounter the client services dragon, as I like to call it. So this uh, dragon is about, uh, this dragon is about, uh, uh, represents the, the pressure you have to actually get a lot of jobs in, because you need to pay everybody's salary. So you're hiring these people, you pay their salary, uh, and then, uh, but they, you do actually need, need new projects all the time to feed to the dragon. And this leads to uh, 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 something I call the great people paradox. So this dragon is hungry, you always need to feed it. Um, and you, you actually sell, uh, uh, sell projects to your clients based on the great people you have, um, but, uh, but then, uh, but then you actually need new projects all the time to be able to pay these people. So that means you, uh, you sometimes are in a position where you need to take on, on some non-awesome jobs and uh, your, your employees will start hating you for it because they, they are in these inspiring projects all the time. Then they uh, have an incentive to leave and they can really tumble down into, uh, into a situation where you, are, where you have neither good customers nor uh, uh, employees. Oh, my clicker is uh, messing up a bit. So yeah, uh, this is the right slide. Uh, so the fourth option is the one I like best, uh, but it's, it also has issues, is running a product company. So uh, uh, when we got started, we of course looked up the base camp uh, like everybody does, uh, and we tried to emulate what they do. And uh, DHH has a, a really great presentation uh, back from 2008, where he kind of goes against the whole venture capital uh, model, where you uh, uh, just grow for growth's sake. Uh, and and he, he came up with this, I think it's a pretty good joke. So, uh, so, so what's the thing in between? It's price. Just having a price is a really important thing for uh, running a product business. And uh, of course, it really worked for him, because if you can afford having a racing team as a hobby, you obviously did something right. Uh, but I think this is not the complete story. There's actually a, a really crucial component missing here. Um, and that explains why so many uh, product companies fail. Um, so this is us, like back in the day before when we were still naive and thought this whole thing would be easy. And we actually had, had no idea uh, how this whole product thing would work. Uh, so back when we first had a client services agencies, agency, we, we had some like other product ideas before we started doing AppSignal. So, uh, and then naively we thought we could combine these two things. So the, here's what we tried uh, before we did AppSignal. 
So we tried to turn client work into a product a few times. So for example, we had one e-commerce uh, 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 Rails engine uh, that we sold to some fashion companies and we basically just built websites for them based on this, on this core, but it ended up being such a spaghetti code base with stuff for each customer, for each client in the main code base that we were unable to sell it uh, already or open source it to do anything useful with it. Uh, secondly, we had, uh, we had a bunch of projects with partners that did the business side. So we thought, okay, let's, uh, we'll build this thing and we don't know how to market. So, uh, and then we, we met these people who were supposedly good at marketing. Uh, what often happens then is that you build this thing and then the people who are supposed to sell it uh, are actually really not that good at selling it. They're just sell good at selling themselves to you. So then you, you made a huge investment and, uh, and basically you get nothing in return. And uh, that can be really frustrating. Probably a lot of you have been in that uh, position. Um, and thirdly, we started loads of projects, but we didn't actually ship them. So this is probably something you're also, also familiar with. Uh, if, you do an, uh, if you try a new product idea, the first 80% is awesome. Uh, and you do it over the weekend, and it, it looks like it's almost finished. But then actually finishing uh, the last 20% is super hard and takes weeks. Uh, so that's a, that's a really huge uh, bump you have to go over to be able to ship anything. So then we just gave up. We, we thought like, okay, let's just, just, let's just uh, uh, become a really good, good client services firm. Um, but like, we were sort of unhappy about this, but we just did not really see how we could do it. So what happened then is that, uh, that, that to keep our, uh, uh, our people happy, we introduced 20% uh, time. So we gave, uh, even though like, these people may, maybe not, were not working on the most amazing projects all the time, at least on Fridays they could work on stuff uh, uh, they found interesting. And then something happened. We had this idea for, uh, for a product. Um, and it's, uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, I realized when uh, uh, listening to David's keynote uh, yesterday that AppCycle is uh, actually based on complexity compression. So in Rails 3, uh, uh, access support notifications was introduced, uh, which uh, lets you plug into the instrumentation uh, framework of, of Rails without write, writing a lot of monkey patches. Uh, and that actually allowed us to, to do a project product initially because like our competitor or the, the main companies out there at the time would, uh, would, would have a bunch of monkey patches and like replicating that and actually supporting it would be super hard. Uh, but because active support notifications existed, we could uh, just hook into that and, uh, and that made all their life much easier. So I think you can really see the complexity compression uh, principle uh, play out in reality here. So, now we're finally arriving to the actual topic of the talk, the long, slow SaaS ramp of death. So, uh, this is the, the woman who came up with this con concept. She is the CEO of Constant Contact, uh, which, is a, uh, uh, which is a mail uh, email uh, mailing list delivery software as a service platform. And they started out in, a, it's basically like, uh, like MailChimp. Um, that you're probably more familiar with. And they started out in the 90s where you still had to do your own credit card processing and like build out a lot of stuff, you know, buy servers from Sun, you know, she's, she's seen it all. Uh, and uh, she did a presentation a few years back uh, that introduced this concept that, that really inspired us and like made us see that this thing was actually possible. So uh, let's look at what this thing actually looks like. So this is, uh, this is a pretty typical long, slow, uh, slow ramp of death. You'll see that it's, uh, there's no hockey stick here. I think that's one uh, important aspect of it. Uh, we'll get into the why of this uh, in a bit. Uh, you just see a really slow curve trending upwards. And this is, uh, is, this, is the costs you have in your business. So the costs are a combination of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of salaries, for example, you have to spend on product development and uh, direct costs are such as hosting. So actually in rea reality, it's a bit more like this. You'll see that your costs slightly increase as you, uh, as you grow, but the big core of a chunk of your costs is, uh, is just salaries or the opportunity cost of the people that are working on the product. 
So this is the reason most SaaS companies fail. So you, uh, you start out with a pretty high cost uh, level and, uh, and basically no revenue in the beginning. And you can market and, and sell as much as you want. You're never going to be fast in, in actually getting to the point where you cover the basic costs. So I, I think uh, a lot of people who do products never make it out of this, this first, first red corner. The reason for this is that people are expensive. So uh, if, you, if you have to pay salaries, uh, well, you all know how much developers make and designers as well. Um, so, so, but then you're working as an employee, but even if you're just doing this yourself, uh, you have to take opportunity cost in, into account. So you might uh, have a freelancing job or you might have a good corporate job. If you're not actually uh, making billable hours, uh, you, you will have less money in your bank account at the end of the month. So even if you uh, sort of do it for free by, uh, by working, doing the work yourself, you're, you're still actually losing money. So the second part of this is, uh, so, so this explains why the cost level is, is, is pretty consistent and also high from the beginning. Uh, we haven't looked into, into the reasons why this, uh, uh, the revenue is, is growing slowly yet. And uh, there's some theory here uh, that's really useful to understand. Also, also, if you ever talk to an investor about, uh, about a business like this, they will use these words. So it's, it's pretty, pretty handy to know what they mean. So the first one is customer acquisition cost. And customer acquisition cost is a grouping of all kinds of money that you spend to get new customers. So it's uh, just, just general marketing, it's uh, buying Google ads, it's writing, uh, time you spend on writing blog posts, uh, doing sales. It's a bunch of stuff uh, and you group it all together. So part of this you can really measure. So if you, if you are lucky enough to be in a business where you can put some Google ads all uh, up and people will sign up for a trial, you can really like, calculate exactly how much you're spending on this trial. In our case, that doesn't happen so much. So, so, so you kind of have to bundle up all this, this combination of direct and fake things you do uh, and just, uh, just add them up for the whole month. And then you divide that by the number of customers you got in that month. So I was really happy that I was still able to slip in some Ruby code into this presentation. So, uh, um, yeah, you'll see the calculation here. So in this case, uh, we spent $5,000 on acquisition cost in a given month. Uh, we gave $1,000 of discounts. This is uh, usually add this to the acquisition costs uh, as well. And then we got 30 new customers. And then you sum up the, acquisition, the total acquisition costs plus discounts and you divide that by the uh, customers and you end up with a number. So that's the first part in the whole big calculation of uh, uh, that, we're go that we're going to dive into. The second part is average rev revenue per unit. So this is just a fancy word for uh, how much money are you making per customer. Super simple calculation. You make $10,000 in revenue, and you split it by 200 customers. Next up is gross margin. Uh, this is also uh, actually a very simple concept. It's, it's about how much money, money you have left after running the service. So here you, you make, a make a distinction between direct costs and, uh, and costs of product development. So in this case, you would include uh, things like, uh, uh, like Google, uh, sorry, uh, like uh, customer support, like uh, paying an email delivery service, buying hosting. Uh, basically anything that you really need to operate uh, the service for the specific customer, but you do not include product development at all. So if you build a new feature that, you, that, that will be useful for multiple customers, that's not in here. So let's look at the calculation. So you have, uh, again, have $10,000 in revenue. You're spending $2,000 on direct costs, and you uh, calculate the percentage, percentage of that. So in, that, in this case, it will be 20%. Next up is churn. So this is how many co customers uh, cancel each month. And then you look at the revenue, uh, look at that in, as a percentage of revenue. So if you have a few customers, you take the plan value that they have and you look at how, uh, how that compares to the total revenue you have uh, at that time. 
So in this case, uh, uh, we lose $800 in revenue a month, and again, we calculate a percentage. And churn, uh, you can use, we don't use it in the calculation directly, but you can use it to uh, calculate retention. And this is really a key thing in, uh, in running a SaaS, as we'll see in a bit. Uh, retention is about how many months you, your customers stick around. So uh, the longer, the better. And the easiest way to calculate retention is by uh, running a middle loop like this. So you just keep deducting the, the, the churn percentage from your base, uh, baseline until you reach a number of months where, the, where it kind of reaches zero. And then all these uh, numbers combined lead to uh, uh, the king of, uh, of, of metrics for, for a software as a service company, uh, lifetime value. And lifetime value is calculated like this. So you take the, uh, uh, multiply the average revenue per unit uh, with retention, and you multiply it with gross margin, and you deduct the customer acquisition cost from it. So uh, uh, I made an example of, uh, of a pretty, pretty typical use case for, these, uh, uh, for, for a customer that might happen in the real world. So you sp you're spending $200 to acquire the customer, then she signs up for a $50 a month plan, and then she churns after using the product for 28 months, which is really long, by the way, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a really good score. Um, then you made $1,400 in total revenue. Um, you spend $10 a month to actually run the service and pay for hosting and so on, so that's 280 in total. And then you actually made, in the end, after 28 months, uh, you have a total balance of making $920 on this customer. So this is, this is pretty cool, you made over $900, not bad. Like e-commerce companies will be super happy about this number. Um, but now we're getting back, uh, back to the long, slow ramp of death. Uh, you did have to wait five months to even break even, because you, you, you had to make back that customer acquisition cost that you, uh, that you spent. So it, it takes until, uh, until uh, month five, until, until you're actually seeing uh, 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 the balance in your bank account increase. So uh, that's pretty challenging. And, and from this follows uh, uh, this statement. Uh, the money in, in software as a service is ready in keeping customers super happy for a very long period of time. Because a, an existing customer, you already paid off the acquisition cost, so the longer they stick around, the better the margins on this, uh, this customer are actually going to be. So uh, uh, whatever you do, you, you need to make sure that, uh, that your churn is low and that you're actually providing a super awesome service to all your customers, otherwise you end up in this situation where you just keep uh, spending a lot of money on acquiring new customers, but when they drop out six months later, you maybe you didn't even make any money on them because they, they, uh, they just didn't stick around long enough. So the, uh, this leads to pretty interesting situations where you could have a sale uh, for a $10,000 uh, 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 lifetime value customer uh, you're super, super happy, you pop open the champagne. But actually, like if you just look at the revenue uh, for that month where you close this customer, you're not going to see anything. You might even see, uh, depending on the situation, you might even see a dip because you first have to make back the acquisition cost. So that's, uh, that's pretty counter counterintuitive. Like sometimes even doing a lot of really good sales uh, can actually lead you to lose money over the first three months. Yeah, so this happens, you know, you make the awesome sale and, uh, and basically you don't see any, uh, any, uh, anything happening in the graph. And um, yeah, so, so this is sort of a problem. Even if you do everything exactly right, you're still struggling. And you have to be super patient. So this leads us to, to the mission. So, so how can we actually survive this? So, so the, the, uh, the world is really awesome, like w once you climb the ramp, it's, you're in a really good position because you have a base, base of revenue and you just keep adding on top of that and, uh, and that's really nice. But you have to have, uh, you have, to have some, you have, to have, you have to find some way to actually make it through the first part. 
and just to illustrate how dire the situation can be, this is the two first two months of AppSignal. So as you'll notice, in the first month, Clemens, which is a, is a friend of ours, he actually signed up. He was our first customer. That was awesome. We made 50 euros. Next month, we doubled our revenue, which is a super good uh, growth percentage. And then we actually made 16. So 350, you'll see there is tax. So yeah, uh, you know, you, you cannot even buy lunch for, for the whole team with that kind of money. So how do we survive it? So uh, I, I don't have all the answers here, but I, I will share some stuff that, uh, that we find useful. So we did a lot of freelancing. So uh, this is probably not what you were hoping for. Uh, we just uh, uh, financed the whole thing by working for, uh, for other clients. Um, we decided early on that we would just do it on an inf individual basis because we were really not passionate about the product company anymore. Um, yeah, I wish it were different, but uh, th that's why we did it. Uh, second thing we did is just being super cheap. So uh, we didn't have an office, we spent no money. I actually uh, had the same laptop for like more than two years, which, which had never happened to me before uh, since I was 18 or something. Um, we did meetings at a, at a train station. You know, it's, it, uh, you, you, you just have to be really picky about what you spend your money on. Uh, this is a huge one. If you can get uh, some customers that pay up front, uh, that's, that's sort of like getting an investment. If, if somebody believes in you and they pay you for the whole year uh, uh, in the first month, you actually make back the acquisition cost immediately and you have some free cash you can use to, uh, uh, to, uh, to invest in some stuff that you otherwise couldn't have done. Um, so this, this, I think this is one of the, like if you take one thing away from this, if you really do decide to start your product company, like really focus on trying to get some customers to pay, uh, to pay a big chunk of money uh, for the first year. Another advantage is that it will show you if you're already on the right track, because if people will commit to something like this, you know, that you're probably really solving a problem for them. Um, this was a pretty hard one for us as Dutch people. So we're, 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 we come from a culture where you're, there's quite a lot of pressure to be sort of modest and not, uh, and not be like too, too bold about uh, stuff that you cannot actually execute on yet. Like but this, this is something we really needed to do. So we, we, uh, we actually sold the product to, some, to a customer that had to cancel the deploy three times because our infrastructure just, just collapsed the moment they turned it on. Um, I think like if you if you're like sort of upfront about it afterwards and really really work hard to fix it, uh, that can be okay. It wasn't our case. Um, at some point, we actually took a bit of money from some advisors. So we took we asked some people from the local local startup scene to just help us a little bit, and they were interested in also uh, providing a loan that that they might convert to stock uh, later on, and that was really useful to uh, to scale the, the company up a bit faster. Um, now we get into some more like classical startup advice, but the, which which you'll see uh, everywhere. But actually, we didn't we didn't actually follow it that much, so I think it's it's still worth repeating. Uh, I think like as developers, like a really big pitfall is that we are good at writing code. So so if you see like a, a problem in the business uh, early on, you're really tempted to solve it by by writing these scripts to fix it. But actually, in most cases, you're better off just, just spending an hour a week uh, on, on doing the task manually. So like, don't write out the whole bidding system or whatever. That will, that will totally slow down your product development because you'll have all these code bases to maintain and, uh, and probably they're going to change so much anyway that there's no use in, uh, in, in building out the thing in the first place. Yeah, talking to your customers is huge, both uh, to learn about like, what the product actually should be uh, but also to stay motivated. If you uh, if you, if you're holed up in your uh, little room all the time, you can get a little bit depressed. And if you actually speak to these people that use your product and they are happy about it, that can provide a lot of energy. Um, this is uh, something that we really did. This is like we we built something for people that we like. So uh, I think this can also help, really help with motivation. If it's, uh, if, if it's a crowd of people you understand and you feel something for, 
that's, that makes it a lot easier than, than just picking some random people like, uh, I don't know, like if you, if you don't really like lawyers and you're building a product for lawyers, uh, you're probably going to have, have less fun time than if you, uh, if you actually like your customers. Uh, writing a lot of content, I think, is key, especially if you try to sell something to developers. Like, I think more and more markets uh, just, just trying to do ads and, and like pushing your message into people's faces uh, doesn't really work. So, uh, so, so if you have good, good content out there, people will find you and will have positive impressions and, uh, and maybe at some point they will, they, they will think like, hey, why not try this product? Um, the last part is, uh, is, is about vision and, and the way the brain works. So I think this, this like understanding this part has been really beneficial for us. So let's go back in time to about four million years ago. Like this, this is the time when humans first started uh, uh, climbing out of trees and going, uh, going out on the Great Plains. And they, look, and they looked at the spot at the horizon and actually went there. And that's, I think, is uh, uh, really the main thing that divides us from, uh, from the animal kingdom, uh, the, the rest of the animal kingdom, is that we actually sort of can have a vision of the future and uh, can take steps to, uh, to try and achieve that vision. Um, and, and I think this really helps, uh, 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 like uh, my colleague uh, Wes came up with a metaphor that, that, that like doing a product is like being in the desert between two oasises. And even if you're halfway there, it can still be really tempting to go back. Like if this uh, old client of yours is, uh, is, 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 is doing you this great offer, you have to be, you really have to know why you're still, still on this path uh, for you to be able to say no. And this all comes down to, uh, to, to the way the human brain works. So, so generally, the human brain has three uh, layers. So you, you have the, the, old, the very old reptilian brain, which is about physical safety and about uh, the fight or flight response. You've got the limbic brain, which is about the social part, and the cortex, which is about uh, intelligence uh, and, and can have this vision. So humans can actually use this cortex to have this vision and take steps to, uh, to reach that. But this only works if energy is actually directed to the cortex. So, so you need to be physically and socially safe. And both are pretty hard if you're on the long, slow ramp of death. So physical safety is about, uh, is about just having a roof over your head and being able to provide for your family, that kind of stuff. And this is by definition pretty hard because your, your, your company is dead by default. Uh, you need to find some way to scrape some money together. So it's always stressful. Um, and I think the main thing here is, is communicating about it and uh, uh, trying not to feel bad about feeling bad. So this is pretty painful. And as long as you don't really feel uh, stressed about feeling stressed, I think uh, uh, it's a lot better. Also, I think like the most people in this room uh, always have a fallback because we're developers, so, so we can just go back and make money. So uh, for me, that really helped that uh, uh, just this feeling like, okay, if this fails, I'll at least be able to uh, make some money again at some other gig. And the next part is social safety. So um, like uh, this is the second layer of the brain. If, if you're in a situation where uh, uh, where people are, um, uh, where, where just uh, your team dynamics are off, or people are kind of like playing games behind people's back, it gets really hard to execute this vision. Uh, so there's a bunch of things you can do to, uh, to, uh, to make this better. So one important thing is just like really appreciating pe that people are different. I think we, in the beginning we had quite a rough time working together because we just have some different personality types uh, and it's and if you don't really like understand the differences there, it can you can lead to a lot of conflict because you're always in this special special situation because basically your business is not working. Uh, one thing we use a lot is the Disney brainstorming method. Um, that's a, a way of of, uh, of having a conversation within a team where you where you have three distinct phases. Phases. You first focus on uh, on fantasizing, like imagining how awesome this thing can, can be. Then you do a phase where uh, you talk about the realistic implications of it. And finally, you talk about the risks. And the nice thing about this is that people that have a different emphasis in their personality type on one of these three aspects uh, know for sure that they will get their say. 
Uh, otherwise, you'll often see that you have a, a, a brainstorm session and some people are talking about risk and, and other people are fantasizing at the same time, which can lead to uh, big confrontations. I'm going to skip this. So, um, yeah, so I think my message here is realize, realize that spending time on making team structure right is very important. Uh, it's going to be a long road, it's going to get messy, and uh, you're going to have to be stressed, and, uh, and uh, uh, making sure you're doing this with just a bunch of people you really like and appreciate is, uh, is I think, really key to, to success. Yeah, and once you get these two levels of uh, safety taken care of, you can really execute this vision. So we spent a lot of time really thinking about what kind of company we wanted to be, and we still, uh, uh, and we still prior prior periodically revisit that. So that's, that's about all I have for you today. So my conclusion, I think from a few years of running a business like this, is you need to be super patient. Uh, it's, it's pretty brutal to actually survive the first part of the long, slow, uh, sad ramp of death. Uh, once you pass this base cost level, it's, it's awesome because then the whole thing that's, that's working against you in the beginning is actually working for you in later stages of the business because you have this huge uh, uh, amount of revenue that, that's just a, a basis for everything you're doing. And you, you don't really have these problems with financing the growth anymore uh, uh, because you already uh, have good margins. Uh, it helps a lot to make a product for people you understand and like. Um, and finally, like I, I'd really emphasize thinking about exactly what you want to be uh, and how you're going to get there and make sure you have the team dynamics in place to, uh, to actually make that happen. So I'd like to close up with uh, a nice inspirational quote from some, I actually forgot who, who, who came up with this, but I think it's an old Chinese uh, proverb. So uh, I think this is really the right way to think about it. Yeah, it's like planting a tree. Uh, you, it will take you a long time, but it will be worth it uh, if you do. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.